Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not only for today's hearing, but your continued efforts to make the coal mines in the United States of America safer. I uh, thank the committee for allowing us to come here today. Unfortunately, uh, as has been mentioned here, this is not our first opportunity to speak to you about a tragedy in the mining industry in the United States. I am humbled to be in the presence of these family members. We've had the opportunity to work with them over the past few days, and in fact, over the past month or so. And I want to commend the courage that they demonstrated to come here today in the face of great grief and tragedy in their families and courageously sit before you and testify. We could all learn something from this kind of courage and this kind of leadership. I want to thank all those rescuers who risked their lives. We had three uh, individuals give their lives trying to save someone else. And the Bible tells us there's no greater thing that can be done on this earth than to give your life or offer your life to save someone else. I have been highly critical of MSHA, and I plan to be, do so again today, but I want to make it perfectly clear that I'm not talking about those brave men and women who walk into those coal mines every day alongside our members and the non-union workers in this country. And I want to commend uh, the family of Mr. Jensen, who is here with us today, for their great sacrifice. And I want to make it very clear about what we're talking about. We're talking about the policymakers at the top and the culture that exists within MSHA when we talk about them. And I also want to mention that we are joined here today also by family members from SAGO and Jim Walter Resources also. We come as members of the union. We come as non-union miners. We come as family members grieving. But we all come with a single purpose, Mr. Chairman, and that is to hope and pray that we can get our government to move to make the mines safer in the United States of America so that when a coal miner walks out of that door going to work without a lunch bucket in his hand and gets in his truck or his car and leaves for work, that family has a reasonable expectation in the greatest country on earth that that miner is returning. And I don't think that's too much to ask of our government. Mr. Chairman, I speak today not uh, as the president of the union per se, but I have 36 years experience here. I was a coal miner myself for six years. I represented workers on the health and safety committee. I represented workers as a district representative. I work, represent workers now. I'm very fortunate to do so at the national level. And today we have members uh, of our union that have traveled here from uh, across the, the eastern part of the country to be with us today because they are concerned about what's going on in the coal mines in the United States of America, and we're very thankful for them to being here. I want to speak to you today, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and just point out something that is very evident to every expert in the United States of America, and this just isn't my personal opinion. I would point out that this has been shared by the Colorado School of Mines. This is shared by NIOSH. This is shared by former director of MSHA, David McAteer. There is no way that this co-operator should have submitted this mining plan. There is no way that this government should have approved this mining plan. And anyone that has any knowledge of coal mining, you heard that previously from a previous panel an experienced miner who said, I couldn't believe it when I looked at this mining plan. The real question for our government, the real question for this panel would be, for my uh, expe expectations would be, why would a co-operator believe that they could submit this plan and give it a, get it approved? And why would that plan be approved in 12 days? And we can talk a lot here, Mr. Chairman, about what happened here, and we can have a very extensive investigation. By the way, I support your efforts in this investigation to get to the bottom of what happened here. But what we have now is a co-operator who submitted this plan and a government agency that approved this plan, the only ones being involved in this investigation. And I want to speak for these families for a moment, not just these families, but I want to speak for a second for the Sago families, and I want to speak for the Jim Walter families and the Darby families. It is just atrocious the way we treat families in these disasters. They're the last people that know anything. 
They are not told anything. They're not part of the investigation. And they've got to read a lengthy document two, three, four years later to find out what happened to their loved ones. We can do better than that in the United States of America. I'd be happy to ask, answer any question that this panel has. And we had submitted a very lengthy written document. With that, I thank you for conducting this hearing, Mr. Chairman.